Hello world, welcome back to Golf Subpar with Colt Nost and Drew Stoltz. We are just two weeks away from the start of the Ryder Cup over in Rome at Marco Simoni. And boy, do we ever have a massive guest for you today. Cannot wait to get to that. But before we do, we've actually had some guys. Team USA just took a trip over to Rome. Nine of the or yeah, nine of the twelve guys made a trip. Mm -hmm. Xander Shoffley, Patrick Cantley, and Jordan Spieth were not able to make the trip. But the other nine went over, played a couple of rounds. Um, have talked to some of the guys that were involved, said pretty much all of them. I think the, the common theme is this course is wild. The elevation changes are nuts. The rough is apparently ridiculously nasty, like pitch out rough. They said we're going to have to have a lot of volunteers over there to help find the golf balls if you do miss the fairway. But, man, the more and more I hear about this place, the more ex excited I am to get over to Rome. Yeah, and, you know, the Europeans got a lot of attention for what they did over in Paris. Grow the rough up, shrink the fairways. They hit irons off the tees. We hit drivers. We don't know how it played out. And that, that's kind of the narrative is like the Europeans are shorter and more accurate. We're longer and more crooked. Well, if you actually look at it, like statistically, this year, the teams, if you break it down from top to bottom, they're actually slightly longer than we are and also slightly less accurate. I mean, it's basically like a toss up. It's by a very, very marginal amount but like that's not really the narrative anymore so if they if they want to shrink it all up and things like that it, it's pretty much heads up uh, off the tee but that's exactly what i heard from the guys that were over there is just like it doesn't feel that much like a what you think of when you think of european golf yeah like the, more american style the elevation changes and stuff that's pretty rare over there yeah the walk is apparently brutal um so that'll be something to see like you know how, how much do you conserve energy for these guys because playing 36 multiple days in a row could be exhausting for some of the guys but it's gonna be a lot of fun man i can't wait you know i saw some pictures from the team over there they were looking incredible so good in their rlx gear getting ready for the Ryder cup i can't wait to see all of them in their uniforms here in a couple of weeks that's right it is coming up soon colt and as you know the rlx golf collection draws inspiration from the traditional aesthetic of polo updating it to create a modern sensibility focused on performance-driven design. From sophisticated styles to the most technologically advanced fabrics available, RLX Golf is the ultimate in functional luxury and provides pieces that are ready for whatever the conditions bring, on the course or off. Ralph Lauren is the official outfitter of the United States Ryder Cup team and partner of the AJGA. Ralph Lauren is proud to continue its sponsorship of golf ambassadors Andrea Lee, Billy Horschel, Davis Love III, Devin Bling, Doc Redman, Jonathan Bird, Nick Watney, Sean Foley, Smiley Kaufman, Todd Anderson, Tom Watson, Trevor Werblow, Troy Taylor III, Tyler Strafacci, and Captain Zach Johnson. The RLX Golf Collection is available in select Ralph Lauren stores, exclusive private clubs and resorts, and online at ralphlauren.com. Go get yourself a little something nice for the upcoming battle in rome look good i'm hyped look good it. play good america let's go mm -hmm. just Bald two eagles weeks away i can't wait but you know we didn't have any golf this week there was mm -hmm. some dp world tour stuff lpga stuff but for us it's all about football it is officially back texas may or may not be back Big. you think they're back haven't I, heard that in a while. I like what I saw. It's bold. Sorry, Justin Thomas. They absolutely just dominated the Crimson Tide. That was fun to watch. Quinn Ewer played fantastic. Texas defense is good. Um, college football is in the swing of things. Uh, very, very excited for that. Except this week it sucks. There's no no two ranked teams are playing each other. There's no there's nothing like virtually nothing what are we doing? that's good. How do you week? not every week have a massive game? College game day uh, in Boulder for Colorado, Colorado State, uh, Colorado State. Not the strongest of opponents. Also, uh, Fox Big Noon is there as well. So I think they're just going to follow Dion around for a while uh, until he loses. But there's no monsters. It's the, it's the There's a few decent ones, but it's there's no like top 10 matchups or anything like that. But we will still have some bets that we'll fire on. Well, You're hot, bud. Week one of the NFL. I You're am hot, two and oh, I'm got less the, hot. One of the greasiest covers of all time in the, in the Oregon-Texas Tech game. The, that was so The fumble to return for a touchdown with 40 seconds left to cover. Beautiful. Good things happen to good people. That's what I like to say. Absolutely. But we'll get to some picks later on. I am 2-0 and to start the season. Um, but the NFL is back. My Dallas Cowboys. Sorry, producer Mike. Absolutely bitch slapped uh, the New York our Giants. Our producer's name is Mark. <laughs> oh, God. Just for the Mike. record. Uh, We've been doing this for quite some time. It is Mark. You got, I'll introduce you after the show. Perfect. Yeah. I, you know, it's like Stephen A. Smith. You know, he got, he got called Skip. The other day it happens we have a producer mike on our serious xm show producer mark you got bitch slapped sorry about it um 160 Oof. million for that quarterback daniel jones is a bad want to be for, asking for a refund bad week for expensive quarterbacks joe burrow looked like Dude, he'd happened? never played in the rain before i was yeah. like why is deshaun watson he seems to be able to throw it they seem to be able to catch it burrow couldn't even get one to spin uh that was strange and 
adding uh, to an already shitty start to the football season for me after TCU's loss to the to the Muffaloes. Uh, the Broncos look exactly the, the same as last year. Yeah, the Muffaloes. Is that what you call them? The, the Colorado Muffs. Yeah, oh. yeah, you like that? Oh. Yeah, the Muffs. Uh, the real they actually deal look right pretty now. good. But uh, Broncos look the exact same. Oh, can you score no points but still hang around the entire game, give yourself a little bit of a hope, and then lose on a game-winning drive or not get a stop? Yeah, we sure can. We did it. Oh, and we missed an extra point, which cost us the game. I know nice. it sucks y'all lost, but I did like the onside kick to start Love the Love that. Just have That's a little fantastic. balls. Like, let's just let's at least throw a weight around if we're going to suck. That I was... don't – I'm not convinced we're going to suck. We're going to be better. They looked better, but – that's, that was just like a microcosm of the entire last season. Do nothing offensively. Still be there. Have a chance. I don't know, man. You lost Lose. to the Raiders. They're not supposed to be very good. They're not supposed to be very yeah. good. That's why that's supposed to be one we should win. But more importantly, the Cowboys won 40 to nothing. Micah Parsons, just in case y'all are going up against the Cowboys, maybe try blocking him. You should just fight. a thought. You should fight him after no. Canelo. Wow, I love him. Yeah, but just in case. Just to he's see fine. what he's all about. Uh, I got to meet him at, at Vegas and Delilah's when we were there for the 8 a.m. thing. He was hanging did you, around. Did you size him up a little bit? I was like, yeah, I probably couldn't block you either. You're different. Yeah, so I'm telling, I was like, uh, Cowboys away. defense is stay filthy. Away. Massive game this this yeah. week. Got Aaron Rodgers coming to Jerry World, looking to just dominate New York. Both New York teams right out of the gate. So can't wait. Good news is football is back. This is also perfect for you because like now after especially after Shut week up. one, you're in the position where like now the expectations are high. Like of course it's they are. Super Bowl or nothing and just setting yourself up. I had nothing. You're, you're vulnerable. I had nothing. I just wanted to see how they came out week one and and then judge them from there. I, I was very quiet during the offseason, during training camp. Now I'm very excited. You're right. I could be let down. But good news is because the Cowboys dominated the Giants, we got a, a new guest on subpar. We're going to have Jerry Ferreira, a.k.a. Turtle, from Entourage joining the show very soon. That We had a little bet, and like I said, 40 to nothing. Jerry, can't wait to have you on the show. Can't wait for Jerry. One of the greatest shows of all time. And uh, maybe he and our producer, Mike, could uh, just chop it up. Share, Mike, share Mark, their sorrows. When we Gold beat jacket, you, green jacket. Yeah. When we beat you that bad, we just call you whatever you want. Fair enough. All right, well, we have a massive guest this week, and we don't mess his name up. He's the one... The only four-time major champion making his seventh appearance at the Ryder Cup. Rory McIlroy is finally on subpar. It's been a long time coming. How about just seven Ryder Cups no already? Probably not slowing down for uh, the foreseeable future. But it's fun to get it. Like, we've had some some U.S. guys. We got to talk, to talk to Zach Johnson about it. Like, let's get a little European perspective. You know what I mean? We like that. So, yeah. um, dude, I just the more I hear it from both sides, the more I think this is just going to be a – this is going to be a battle. Like, this is going to be close. This is going to be a lot of close. fun. And this episode is fantastic. Cannot wait for y'all to hear it. But before we get to our guest this week, we'd like to welcome a new sponsor to the show in Golf Pride. Golf Pride knows that a grip isn't only a grip. It's a piece of performance equipment that only physical connection between a golfer's hands and their clubs. A recent study conducted by the Golf Pride Innovation Team showed, on average, a focus group of adept golfers gained an extra two yards of carry when they played with new grips. Every inch matters, please. Our guest mm -hmm. this week, Roy McIlroy, uses the Golf Pride MCC grip built with hybrid technology to give enhanced stability in all weather conditions. It's this bad boy right here if you're watching on YouTube. It's a Get beautiful it and you'll swing like right Rory. Yeah. That's a guarantee. You'll hit it Money 340 back. yards in the air, dead straight, no big deal. Subpar listeners can now go to golfpride.com and use code SUBPAR10 to get $10 off when you buy 13 or more swing grips. That's code SUBPAR and the number 10. SUBPAR10 at golfpride.com for $10 off 13 or more grips if you want to be like Rory McIlroy. Only cost you, you get 10 bucks off. And by the way, there's nothing better than new grips on clubs. It's, it's almost as good as getting new clubs. I do love the first fresh time grip. you hold I'm like, oh my God. I'm, I'm a back. golf pride. How do you miss it with these? What things? are you? I'm a golf pride tour velvet That's guy. That's what I am with yeah. a reminder. Oh, you're a reminder? I'm a reminder and an extra wrap. Gotta I used, have the reminder. I used to do reminders and then it would panic me when certain if like a different person put it on because like their yeah, their square is not real anal square. about the way yeah. it goes on. And then all of a sudden you go to like demo a club and it's a round grip and I'm like, can't I don't know that I can hit it. All right, I don't know well, how to grip it. If you're a guy that likes to, or drop that pen. Just hold on. If you're a guy or a woman that likes to watch and see our beautiful faces during these podcasts, mm -hmm. we're very excited to tell you that Subpar has officially moved to its very own brand new YouTube page. Make sure to go subscribe at golf underscore Subpar on YouTube and check out this week's full video interview with Roy McElroy. Once again, like, subscribe, and set alerts to the new Subpar YouTube channel because that is where all the new episodes will be from now on. And we'll start taking you outside of the podcast studio with us too. See you there. All right, here he is, the one, the only, Roy McElroy on Subpar. 
All right, ladies and gents, what a treat we have in store for today. It would take way too long to do a complete resume here in the intro, so let's just say we have a future Hall of Famer, one of the most talented dudes to ever lace him up on a golf course, and will be making his seventh Ryder Cup appearance for Team Europe soon. We are thrilled to have him. Rory McElroy joins us. How are we doing, Roars? All good. Thanks for having me on. I'm, I'm glad we, we get to finally do this. Well, why don't we just set this straight real quick? What what is t- what has took so long to get you on subpar? Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> the hard the hard hitting questions first. Um, I don't know. You know, I feel like there's been a few podcasts that I've went on before that I've said some things that um, have either landed me in hot water. And knowing that you're asking the questions, Colt, uh, I felt like I, I got to be pretty. I got to be pretty careful with what I say on here. But um, that's fair. No, you know, I look, hey, I, I trust you. We we walk the fairways every week when you're doing your stuff for CBS. And um yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of the show. I've I've listened to to a lot of them. Uh and I just thought it was time for me to to come on and uh sort of chat it up with you too. Well it works out perfect yes. because the Ryder Cup is just a few weeks away. Like Slee said, you're making your seventh appearance. So your episode's gonna come out, and then the next week is Jordan Spieth, and then it'll be the Ryder Cup. So I'm going to go ahead and let you go right now. Do you want to go ahead and deliver a message, set the tone with Jordan that we can, we can relay to him when he comes on? It's actually funny. So I, uh, another, another podcast that I'm a big fan of, um, which is the shotgun start. Uh, Andy Johnson just, just, uh, sent me a couple of, uh, items, uh, that they just got logoed up. And one of his bits is about Jordan and being just a guy. And I have a, just a guy hat. And, uh, I I was maybe going to wear that, but that's, I feel like that's a little too disrespectful to Jordan. He's got too he's got too good too good of a resume for me to do that to him. But um he is like he is uh a stalwart of the American team. Um I think the American team have really turned a corner the last few years. I think the cadence of them playing President's Cup, Ryder Cup, President's Cup, Ryder Cup, they've got a really good continuity at the minute. Um, but they haven't won in Europe in 30 years. So um, you know, the the odds are you know, they are still the favorites. Um, if you look at if you look at the bookies, um, but at the same time, I'm 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 feeling real. I'm feeling good about our team. I'm feeling much better about our team than I was maybe say eight months ago. So um, I think we're in a really good spot. Yeah, the Vegas feels the exact same way you do. They like you mentioned that that line keeps shrinking and shrinking. But let's just get in r- straight into the Ryder Cup stuff. America obviously announced their captains picks recently. Um, anything surprising out of those picks for you? I don't think so. Um, I, I thought the whole JT thing was completely um, like I felt the the conversation around it was completely unjustified because, in my opinion, being a European and knowing that I have to face some of these guys, uh, honestly, there's 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 other guys on that team that I'd rather face than JT. So knowing that as a European, I'm uh, to me it was a no brainer. I you know even though he's not had the best year and he's, he's struggled for form, JT's still one of the first guys you put down on that team sheet for the U.S. Um, I thought it was a no-brainer. And then the other picks were, yeah, I mean, you look at, um, you know, the other one that was probably a little, I don't want to say contentious, but maybe debated was Sam Burns. But you look at how, how Sam does in terms of he won the match play this year. Um, he putts so well. Uh, and, and we all know at the end of the day, the Ryder Cup comes down to, to probably who holds the most putts. So um, I thought the picks were, look, there's going to be a couple of guys that feel hard done by, um, you know, especially Keegan and the, and the, the year that he put together. But um, it's, a, it's a really, really strong U.S. team. And, uh, you know, if, if, if I were Zach, I'd be, I'd be really happy with the guys that I've got. Yeah, I thought JT just got absolutely crucified, and it, and it wasn't fair because you look at his record. I used Ian Poulter as an example for your team. Like the last four times he's played the Ryder Cup, he's been a captain's pick, and not one time has anyone said that's a terrible pick. You shouldn't go with Ian Poulter. Like there's certain guys the Ryder Cup just brings out the best in them, and I think JT is one of those guys. Yeah, and I think I think comparing JT to Ian Poulter does JT a little bit of a disservice in terms of their CVs and their careers and and everything. But you know, to me, it's more like. JT, if you're going to compare him to someone on the European team over the years, it's probably Sergio, just in terms of that fire and that passion and obviously the resume that he has as, a, as an individual as well. So, um, but yeah, I, 
uh, to me the whole time i i thought jt was a no-brainer i mean i i i totally expected him to be on the team when we've had a couple of the american guys that are going to be playing in rome on the team we just had zach johnson on recently talking to him talk us about the european side like how much does luke donald seek out your opinion you're one of the pillars of that team you know going back you know this is your seventh one but how much has he taken your opinion the opinion of the other automatic qualifiers when it comes to making his picks yeah, I mean, a little bit. I, you know, Luke was, we live on the same street in Jupiter. He was over at my house two days ago and we had a coffee and we chatted about it. So, yeah. um, a little bit, he hasn't, he certainly hasn't leaned on me a lot. I, I think he, he feels like he's got it under control. Um, we've got a great backroom team, uh, especially with Eduardo Molinari doing all the stats and the analytics and him being a vice captain as well. Um, you know, he, they're going to let the, they're going to let the numbers speak for themselves, but obviously there's that, you know, little bit of um, team chemistry and trying to create a little bit of continuity that we've had over the years, especially, you know, the Euro the European team is very much in transition at the minute with a lot of the guys that, you know, I was, I was just thinking, uh, speaking, I was speaking with my wife a couple nights ago and I was saying, this is going to be my first, this is my seventh Ryder Cup, but my first Ryder Cup where Sergio Poulter, Westwood or GMAC aren't, either on the team or vice captains or are some way involved. So it's, it's a bit of a, it's a bit, it's a bit of a transition for us, but um, it being a home rider cup, I think it's, it's great to, to in, introduce, like, I, you know, there's a lot of debate about like the rookies on our team, but I'd much rather introduce them to the rider cup at home in Italy, rather than two years time in Beth page black, where it's obviously going to be a really hostile environment for us. And that's going to be difficult. So you know, if I'm sort of looking into Luke's crystal ball, um, which I'm not, I mean, I, I certainly don't have any influence over the picks, but uh, I think it would be prudent that it would be a good idea to um, to go with youth and and um, especially at a home rider cup. I just think that, you know, we've, we've got a really good core of seven or eight guys that are experienced and then, um, you know, roll the dice a little bit with some of these younger guys. Yeah, I think you're in a great spot. I mean, obviously, your top guys are playing really well right now. Victor Hovland on the run. He's on. John Rom, yourself. Um, but you look at Ludwig Aberg, who I think is a guy that should be on that team. Just a young stud. My buddy actually in June gave me five to one odds that he wouldn't make the team because I, I was all about Ludwig. And then he got paired together with Luke Donald the next week in Detroit, which worked out perfect for me. But have you had a chance to spend any time with him? And what are your thoughts on his game? You know, I haven't. I uh, I haven't got to play with him yet. Um I mean, my longest conversation with Ludwig's probably being like five minutes on the fitness trailer uh, during the Canadian Open. Uh, but every everyone that I've spoken to that's played with him says he's an absolute stud. He drives the shit out of the golf ball, apparently. Um, you know, and just some of the highlights that I've seen of him and, and how he, you know, he's a pretty, um, you know, big ish guy with longish levers, but his swing looks very much under control. And it just seems like every single time the driver comes out of the same window at the same ball speed. And yeah, I mean, you look at his numbers off the tee and you look at the way, uh, you look at the way the, um, the course is going to be set up in Rome. Uh, I, it's very hard for me to sit here and not think that, um, you know, he's, he's going to be, if not on the team, then very heavily considered to be on the team. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to influence things in any way. And as I said, I'm not anything to do with the selection process. But um, if we think that Ludwig is going to be on the European Ryder Cup team for the next fifteen to twenty years, you know, I feel like now would be the perfect time to introduce him. Yeah, I believe I saw a stat, most likely from Justin Ray on Twitter, that said since the Canadian Open, he's number one in the world strokes gained off the tee. And when you mentioned the setup in Rome, talk to us a little bit, though, about that setup in Rome. What are you guys, I mean, you're, you're kind of known for making the courses favor, you know, what the Europeans do well and take away what the Americans do well, shrink the fairways, grow up the rough. Are you expecting the same in Rome? Absolutely. I mean, I think you have a home course advantage for a reason. Um, and, you know, I've, I've you know, thought this for a while now, but I think one of the biggest accomplishments in the game of golf right now is, is, a team winning an away Ryder Cup. You know, it hasn't happened uh, since 2012. Uh, and I just think you see, I just think you're going to see this pattern of, you know, we're going to, you know, the teams are going to do everything they can to, you know, to set themselves up for success. So if you look at what 
the Europeans do well compared to what the Americans do well. And, and these things are so analytics driven now is, you know, we, we, you know, for the most part, we drive the ball great. If you look at Rambo, myself, Victor, uh, you put Ludwig in there. Uh, and then you look at, you know, just if you, if you break it down in, in terms of the, the parts of the game, um, you know, we, we want to get wedges and short irons out of the Americans' hands. We know that that's what they're really good at. So if we can have, make this a driving and sort of mid-iron to long-iron and putting contest, we feel like that's where we have the, the best opportunity to win. All right, before we get back to Roy McIlroy, I want to tell you about a new partnership with Rad Golf. If you're a single-digit handicapper, a pro, a weekend hack, whatever, this company is for you. They've got a sleek product line that includes high-quality Bluetooth speakers, GPS watches, handheld devices, and first-of-its-kind Laser Pro rangefinder that all work in tandem with each other and easy to use. The popular Sound Plus speaker features visual distance display, audible score, record, and game-changing heckle sounds. we got Ooh, fart like noises. Whoopee cushions, all kinds, air horns. Who's the voiceover for the fart noises, I wonder? I don't know, but I definitely highly recommend it. It makes a lot of fun, and that's what this company is all about. All about having fun on the golf course. These speakers are incredible. You can pair two together and get really loud. 12-hour battery life, which is fantastic. Um, tells you your yardage. You can keep all your stats, whatever you want. All in one. Speakers, GPS, watches, all the things golfers love. Go get after that right now. I'll tell you some good news, too. They got coming this yeah. Laser Pro rangefinder. Yeah. It's coming soon. It has a GPS device in it, so when you lose it, you can go find it. That's helpful. Yes, That's huge. But I highly recommend go check out all their products. We're going to give you 15% off your purchase site-wide at radgolf.com. Use code SUBPAR, and you get 15% off. It's a golf and lifestyle brand with a lot of buzz already brewing. Lots of guys we know on both tours have been involved with the Rad team since its inception, and you're going to be seeing and hearing a lot more about this brand in coming weeks and months as more products hit the market. Once again, go to radgolf.com. Use code SUBPAR for 15% off. Have some fun with Rad Golf. Let's get back to Roy McIlroy. You've played now 26 matches in the Ryder Cup. How are the nerves on that first tee compared to what they were your rookie year? Um, still the same, probably more because I actually really? know how much, I know how much it means now, you know, as a rookie, you're going in there. And, and for me anyway, I was probably a little naive to the whole thing. Um, a little bit oblivious to how much it meant to everyone else. Uh, so as the years have went on, I probably got more nervous and more as I've taken on a little bit more of a leadership role within the team. Uh, you know, I, I, I feel a responsibility that week to, to step up and, 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 and do my thing and win points for the team. And, you know, I know that I'm someone that, you know, the rest of the team look to, and, uh, you know, I take that very seriously. That's cool to hear you say, like, it means even more now than it did when you came out as a rookie. And like you mentioned, you're going to have some rookies now. I mean, you are the team leader, one of the team leaders, at least for team Europe. What do you tell the rookies to try to get them ready that are going to be coming into this for the, for the first time, even, even if it is on home soil. So for me, it's <clears throat> remember, I think the thing is, you certainly don't have to do anything different. Remember the golf that got you on the team. You know, the reason that you're on this team is because of the golf that you've played throughout the past 18 months. And whatever, you know, the one thing that I think we've all done so well as a European team is we understand that, you know, we're all 12 individuals coming together and we still need to be treated like 12 individuals because what works for me to get prepared for a golf tournament mightn't work for John Ram and what works for John Ram mightn't work for Victor Hovland. So yes, you're going to have some team sessions and you're going to have to, you know, do some stuff together. But for the rookies, I would say, you know, whatever you do to get prepared for any given week on the PGA tour or a major championship or whatever it is, just do that. You know, that's whatever makes you feel the most comfortable on Friday morning that you're ready to play just do that. Don't feel like you have to do anything different. Don't feel like you have to do anything that don't feel bad. If you want to take some time away and get some time on your own or get some time with your family, if that's what you're used to on, on any given week, because that's still very important. And if that puts you in the right comfort zone and the right um, frame of mind to play, then, you know, that's what you have to do. Yeah, absolutely. But you know, you've been involved in some incredible matches throughout your time. I think back to the, obviously the singles match with Patrick Reed at Hazeltine. Um, you had a good one with, Justin Thomas in Paris, the uh, yep. Medina, when you were paired with Ian Poulter, and it looked like his eyes were going to pop out of his head when he was making it. <laughs> from everywhere. When you look back over all your matches, is there one that sticks out as the most memorable? 
Probably that one with Pulse. Uh, it was a, so we were down a 10 4 Saturday afternoon session at Medina. And um, we were, Pulse and I were either all square, one down. Uh, I birdied the 13th, the par three to sort of get us going. And then Pulse just took over and it was, it was amazing to see. I mean, it was, it was incredible. I was, I, I, I just stood there. I, I didn't make a contribution for the last five holes, but just the way he played and, and the zone that he got into and the putts that he was holding, it was absolutely incredible. And that, that turned our fortunes around. Like we went from 10, four to 10, six on Saturday night. And we felt like we went into that singles almost leading. Like we were still four points back. We were, te- but you, when, if someone had walked into that European locker room on that Saturday evening, you would have thought we'd won the Ryder Cup. We were that excited. We were that, just those two points. I feel like that meant so much to us. And then that just gave us the platform to go and obviously do what we did on the Sunday. Yeah, the man, the way he can just, he could just flip that switch. It seemed like at events like that. And since we're talking about Poulter, you know, he, Westwood, Stinson, Sergio G. Mack, those guys you mentioned, obviously not going to be there this year for the first time in a long time. Does that change the role that you take on in terms of leadership in the team room and things like that going into this year? Yeah, I think so. I think there's going to have to be some players that step up and, and fill the roles that, um, Poults and Sergio and Westwood and those guys uh, filled for so long. You know, it's as I said, it's it's, it's going to be weird for me to walk into the team room and not see any of those guys there. Um, but as I said, this is a team in transition, and and um, you know we have to look to the future and and try to build for the future. And and it's probably up to guys like you know we still have Justin Rose in there. That's but it is amazing. You know, I'm the third oldest on the European team. You know, that's, yeah. that's, that's crazy to me, but, um, it is going to be got, you know, Rosie, myself, you know, this is only, go- you know, Rambo's still pretty young, but, um, you know, he's one of the best players in the world. And I think there's a lot of guys that look to him. So there's going to be some guys that are going to have to, you know, step into the roles that, you know, some of those European stalwarts of the last 20 years have, have fulfilled and, and everyone's got different leadership roles, right? Like I, I spoke to Luke about this the other day. Like if called upon, I will certainly voice my opinion and say things and, and whatever. But to me, I've always tried to lead by example. So if that means as one of the oldest and one of the, if that means that I'm the first one on the range in the morning or I'm the first one in the team bus or I'm the, you know, just, you know, if people are looking to me to, to see what I'm doing and this is my seventh Ryder Cup, you know, I just want to, I just want them to know that I'm, just as excited and just as up for this as I was in my first. So just trying to do little things like that, that, you know, make the rookies realize that, you know, I'm, I'm just as excited and just as nervous and, and feeling all the emotions just like they are. That's awesome to hear. Uh, I love that. Will, will we be seeing a hatless Roy McElroy at the Ryder cup this year? Yeah, I think, I think so. I think my best rider, I think my best rider cups have been hatless. Um, probably. Yeah. You know, it's going to be, you know, it, it's a little different. It depends. I think Rome's going to be nice weather. Um, get a pretty short haircut. Get a little bit of tan on the forehead. I think. I think. I think that's a that's a good plan. Okay, I like it. Yeah. Well, let's switch gears here a little bit. Obviously, we're really excited for the Ryder Cup, but want to talk some major championship golf here. You're a four time major winner. Obviously, it's been a little bit, but you've been knocking on the door as of late. Seven of your last eight majors, you finished in the top eight. Um, are you frustrated with how it's been going, or are you excited because you feel like you're really close? A little bit of both. Um, I think I'm I'm frustrated that I haven't gotten the job done at least once, um, but I'm excited with how I'm performing in the majors. I mean, just from a you know from a purely strokes gain perspective, if you just look at the breakdown of how I've played the majors over the last couple of years, you know I'm I'm be- I'm like a shot to a shot and a half better per round in the majors than I was during like a four or five year period between 2016 and 2020. So. I'm doing the right things. And the one thing, you know, I've had success on the PGA tour and I've, I feel like I've basically won everything there is to win outside of a major over the past 10 years. Um, but what I've really wanted to do is try to build my game so that it excels at the toughest tests. Uh, and, and that's, you know, I felt like I, you know, sort of like 2018, 2019, 2020, I, I got into this comfort zone where, my game excelled at like run of the mill PGA tour venues. And I, when I went back to 
those venues, like I really got into my comfort zone. Um, but that's not, you know, if you want to, you know, win the biggest championships and you want to, you know, you, you have to, you have to work on your game and, and design it in a way that excels at the toughest test. So the way I played LACC this year, or, um, even like, if you look at my results in the U S open over the last few years, I mean, it's, it's, you know, I, I missed the cut in the U S open 2016, 2017, 2018. And then from 2019 until this year, I haven't finished outside of the top 10. So, um, just trying to do things and that's, it's not, it's, it's course management. It's making better decisions. It's being better prepared. It's it's relishing the fact that major championships bring you outside of your comfort zone, and it's not like the same as a PGA Tour event week in week out. I think that's the the thing that I'm excited about that I've that I've sort of cracked the code on a little bit. But yeah, I'd love to have finished off either St Andrews or LACC um, or Tulsa or you know, there's there's you know probably three or four instances over the last couple of years that I feel like I you know, I, I, I should have, you know, closed the door and, and got that fifth major, but, um, I'm going to keep trying. As I said, at uh, as I said at LACC, I'll, I'll go through a hundred Sundays like that to get my hands on another one. So, um, it's not for lack of trying, it's not for lack of practice. Um, and the more I keep putting myself in that position sooner or later, it's going to happen. Yeah. And, and you seem to be in that position on Sunday, virtually every single major championship and in the media, I know, especially it's basically Win, win majors or bust for you any given year. That's how they evaluate the years, right? You're one of the few guys that's in that position, right? So that's somewhat a privilege as well. But like, is that how you grade your year? Because I mean, you, you win multiple times. You've got 10 consecutive top 10s, you know, which is very, very difficult to do. Are you, do you, are, do you grade yourself strictly on major championship wins? Or, or do you do it differently? I don't, I, I don't because if I, if I graded myself strictly on major championship wins, I'd be miserable for the last decade. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so and, sure. and I'm and I'm not. You know, I've 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 played great golf. I, you know, I, I the consistency level that I've shown over the last few years, I think, is uh, um, a step above. Again, just looking purely at the numbers, I've had my best two seasons of my career last year and this year, just in terms of strokes gained. You know, I've um, I just feel like. And it's hard to say this to people people because people won't understand, and they might think that I'm sort of clutching at a straw here but i am a better player and a more well-rounded player now than i was when i when i had when i won my fourth major back in 2014 like i i am you just have to look at the numbers you have to look at the consistency i am a better player it's just that that hasn't translated into winning major championships and that's a matter of playing your best at the right time um and then if i go back to the two tournaments that i I'm probably the most frustrated about, which would be the old course last year and LACC this year. I just didn't, I didn't put my foot on the pedal enough uh, on Sunday and, and, you know, hold a pot or or hit a shot or or just do something to just get some momentum and go with it. Felt like I was stuck in neutral a little bit for those two final rounds and just never was able to get it out of like second gear. Um, and that's, that's the difference. And, and again, that's, that's experience. And that's just making sure that the more times you put yourself in that position, you learn from it and you move on and you, you just try to be better the next time. I love you saying you're a more well-rounded player right now. That's, that's really cool to hear. And I, I get it. And I also tell people like, you know, Colin Morikawa won two majors very quickly and everybody's like, oh, he's going to win 10 majors. I'm like, yeah, he might, he might only win two as well because where professional golf is right now, it's so deep. There are so many good players. So you can go out there and play your best. I mean, just look at Eastlake last week. I mean, Xander Shoffley played fantastic. He just got absolutely steamrolled by Victor Hovland, and that can happen in major championships. Yeah, it can. Like, look at Brian Hartman at the Open. You know, I, yeah. I, was, really, I was really pleased with my, my week at the Open. I shot, you know, I, I improved my score every day. Uh, I hung in there without having my best stuff. And, you know, I finished, I finished T6 and... No one's going to remember the T6 I had at Hoylake in 2023, but I was happy with my week. Some, some weeks, guys just play better. And that's, that's golf. And I just, sometimes I don't feel like the public understands that. They think, you know, I got to go out there and try to beat 155 other guys. It's not as if you just go out there and, you know, you win major championships or, you know, it's you, there's 155 other guys that are, willing to put in the work just like you are and willing to do anything they can to to make 
make themselves the best that they can be. And Cold, as you said, it's it's the it's the deepest that I've ever, you know, I've played, you know, fortunate enough to have a pretty long career up until this point. And, you know, I started playing on the PJ tour in 2009 and, you know, so 14, 15 years later. And I feel like the, the level just improves every year. These young guys are so ready to come out of college and just win. You look at like a Ludwig or you look at what Scotty's done over the last couple of years and, um, it's just going to continue to be that way. And that's, it's exciting. It's great for the game. I think the game is in a really good place. You've got all these young players coming through that are great. And, um, but yeah, it's, it's not easy to win. It's, it's a, you know, I think having a, you know, two, three, four win season right now is, is, is probably more difficult than it was, you know, 10 years ago. Yeah, that was Colt and I talk about this on radio. We talk about it on this show all the time, just where the modern game is right now. So just even scaling back to 10 years ago, your last major championship win, do you feel like showing up next year at Augusta, there are more guys in that field that have the potential to win that golf tournament than there did 10, 12, 13 years ago? Like there's more guys you got to worry about that could win that? Yeah, I, got, I, I think Augusta is a little different right, because that was probably- of the, invita- the, the invitational nature and you've got the, the arms and you've got the older guys. So you're probably always worried about the same number of people at Augusta. But I think when you go to the opens or the PGA, uh, I think that's where there's, there's more, more and more um, guys that are, that are ready to step up and, and win. Um, Like no one was talking about Brian Harmon before he won the open, the open championship. No one was really talking about Wyndham. Yes. Wyndham had a great win at Quail Hollow, but you know, I don't think Wyndham was one of the favorites to win at LACC. Um, you look at what Brooks did at uh, at Oak Hill coming back from everything, and you know it's you know, any given week, any guy can turn it on and have a great have a great four days and and walk away with a trophy. So it's um, and that's what I think for me. It's like my consistency level is so much that I will finish in the top ten more most likely more times than not but it's it's elevating my game just to that next level to get to the point of you know i feel like a a t7 at oak hill this year for me was like the worst that i could do but then winning it felt you know i felt like to go from a t7 at a a major actually winning it is a massive step and that's the you know that's the difference um sticking on augusta national for a second obviously that's the one that you need for the career grand slam What's that week like for you? Is there is there extra pressure compared to the other majors, considering you haven't done it yet, or is it just one that you know you just, you haven't been able to win yet? Yeah, I think there's a little bit of both. Um, I think because it's sometimes because it's the one that I haven't won. The only thing I think about that week is winning it, and that's not that like, like as you know, Cole. That's not the that's not the way to approach a golf tournament, right? I mean, I'm. You know, so if I looked at the way I approached LACC and it's you're dissecting a golf course and you're like, okay, well, you know, this is how I want to play the first three or four holes. And then, you know, do you, you know, it's, you're, you're just into the tournament, you're into your process and you're into just figuring out a way to manage yourself around the golf course. And I think sometimes at Augusta, I, I'm too much of a leaderboard watcher too early. So for example, this year, Brooks got off to that really hot start and he was on the eighth green on Friday morning and I was on the first green and I think I was even par for the tournament and Brooks had just birdied the eighth hole to go to 10 under for the tournament. So I'm like 10 shots back and I'm already like, feel like I need to chase and I need to like do something, you know? So I think, and it's hard, you know what those leaderboards are like at Augusta. They're those big, you know, you can't miss them. They're everywhere. Um, and I think sometimes at Augusta, I'm just a bit too much of a leaderboard watcher and seeing where I am in relation to the lead and where everyone else is. And, um, I just feel at Augusta, sometimes I get too results orientated too early instead of just getting myself in the tournament, playing my way into contention, like I do at basically every other tournament and then just going from there. So yeah, there's probably, I, I probably get in my head a little bit too much around there at times, but there's been other times where I've handled it. Okay. And I've, I've had good results, but um, yeah, I, I feel there's a there's a different hype to Augusta. There's a massive build up. It's the first major of the year. 
you know, there's a lot of things that are just a little bit different to Augusta and, and, you know, it's, it's trying to manage all of those things at the start of the week as well. Yeah. And Roy, you talked about like, you know, everyone in golf, especially at the top, they're all trying to peak at the same time going into major championship week. That's when you want to be at your best. How has your prep leading into a major championship week changed from where it was maybe when you were a young kid, fresh coming on tour to where it is now? And like, what do you do differently to, to try to be at your best for those weeks? Yeah, so I like to play my way into major championships. Um, I think the reason that I've played so well at the U.S. Open the last few years is the U.S. Open's always been my third event in a row. So I've all, you know, the way the schedule was before next year, it was uh, Memorial Canada and then the U.S. Open. Um, so I always love those two weeks to like know where my game is. And I think as well, when you're playing a ton, you know what your tendencies are. Even if you're not playing your best, you're going to manage your game better. You know, you just everything's just a little sharper. So I think from the start of my career to now, I've realized that to get the best out of myself, or at least to be at a certain level of performance, I like playing my way into to the major championships. So uh, if you look at next year, sort of hard. I'll I'll most likely play San Antonio before Augusta, um, and then I love that Quail Hollows directly the week before Valhalla. You know, the Scottish Open into the Open's nice. And then I think it's Memorial into into the US yeah. Open next mm-hmm. year as well. So it's sort of it's it's I I feel like that's the best way to 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 approach major championships for myself. And um it just means you're in pure playing mode. You're not grinding on the range on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. You know where your game is, you know what you need to do. Um and you've had some pretty recent experience of hopefully getting into contention and, and sort of what your tendencies are under pressure. And, you know, you're just, you're just a little more in tune with, with what's going on, which, which I like. Well, the people in San Antonio are going to be very happy hearing that right there. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, there's, there's a lot, you know, golf's never been talked about more and it's not all positive right now between the PGA tour, live PIF, all that. And as far as the players go, I mean, you've been the spokesman for them. I mean, you have, put yourself out there. You've put a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of energy into this thing. If you could go back and do it all over again, would you still do it? Uh, certain things I would do, absolutely, because I think, look, I, I think with Liv coming along, it, there, it, that was a catalyst to, to some changes on the PGA Tour. Um, and I, I, I said this at the Tour Championship a little bit in a press conference, but the changes that were made at the PJ tour that I got excited about was, you know, like the, the designated event model or basically like all I've really wanted to do is get all the best players in the world together to play more often. I think that's what golf needs. And yeah, this is like with, you know, you know, there is, there's some great players over on live that I wish I could see more often and play against more often Brooks, Cam Smith, DJ, um, you know, whoever else, obviously Bryson's coming back into form. There's, you know, there's, there's a few guys over there that, um, you miss competing against like that sucks. And I, I, I don't like that the game's fractured. Um, I think it's provided players on the PJ tour a little bit of leverage to, to get these changes that, that have happened. But I think now it's, you know, as much as, you know, what happened in June and, and, you know, the, you know, this, this sort of this deal with PIF and PJ Tour and DP World Tour, you know, if it can be done the right way, um, and everyone can like can sort of get together again and make the game less fractured, I you know, I don't see how that's a how that's a bad thing. I just I hate that Liv fractured the game so much. That was a thing to me that really pissed me off. Um, you know, so hopefully we can all sort of figure it out. We can get back together and 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 make the 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 professional game just a bit more harmonious, so that you know we can all compete against each other more often instead of just the four times a year that we all get together at the major championships. Yes, it 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 builds up majors and it makes them even more important than they already were. But to me, I feel like golf's in a really bad spot if if the game's only relevant four times a year. It needs to be relevant more weeks a year than that, and. If that means getting us all back together and playing against one another more often, I'm I, I'm all for that. Yeah, and you've been front and center on the PGA Tour side throughout this entire 
ordeal, which is a lot. By the way, I've said like before, I, th- I think you're doing certain guys' jobs for them almost. Like you're doing the speaking where I think other people should probably be up there. You're a player first. That's what you're supposed to do. But you took on that role. But there's no doubt that that takes a toll on you physically and mentally as well. Is there any way like looking back to to quantify just how much that affected you on, on in both of those ways? Um, honestly, I think it energized me in some ways. You know, it was a, it was a way for me to, you know, I channeled that energy into my golf and, um, I can't say that by doing it, I've played, I've played really well since, you know, you know, since this has all been happening and, and, um, in a way I wanted, you know, I wanted to play so well that I, I could prove to the guys that almost like to the guys that left, there's still a shit ton of money to be made out here. You know, it, yeah. I, do you have to work harder to get it? Absolutely. Do you have to play better? Absolutely. But you can still make a shit ton out here. And I think that sort of energized me to almost prove a point. Um, yeah, like I made $40 million on the PGA Tour last year. Like, you, you cannot argue that players are underpaid. You cannot argue that players are underpaid in the PGA Tour when you can go, go out and earn that sort of money on the golf course. That's a decent year. It's yeah. Kind of, that's about what we make from the podcast. Well, good time. <laughs> Maybe dust off the sticks, work on those injuries, get back out there. There's money to be had, but listen, I follow this man around way too much to realize I want no part of that at all. The way he drives the golf ball is a joke. Yeah. And that actually sets up perfect for your man, Michael Block, who you played with at the PGA on Sunday, Oh, Blocky. Uh, who said if you drove the golf ball for him, he would be number one player in the world. And then on our show, and this doesn't give him shit. This is just a funny statement. But he said, if he drove it for you, you'd be outside the top 100 in the official world golf rankings. Give me a little response to that. Um, <laughs> I, but no disrespect to blocky. I, you know, he is a, he has an unbelievable short game. He does. He, he, the, some of the up and downs he made it on um, that final day at Oak Hill. Um, but I still think, I mean, yeah, like does he, yeah, he, struggles to get the 160 ball speed with a driver and it's you know it's yeah like would he struggle around you know most tour courses absolutely but um i still think i'd be able to manage a way to to get inside the top 100 in the world off his tee shots but uh I've, whether I've he would be it. number one number one in the world i don't, i i find that hard to believe um but i would say so there is a story so this is something that people don't know and this is a funny story and i think this is this just speaks to how confident he is in his short game, but he missed a left on 18 on Sunday at Oak Hill. Um, and the pin was tight left and he was down in the crowd and it was a blind shot. And it was like, there's no way this guy's getting this thing up and down. Like no way. And he hits this shot that lands in the rough between the bunker and the green and trundles down to like six feet. And his caddy's still like, you know, trying to get through the crowd or whatever. So Michael comes up onto the green, marks his ball and gives his ball to Harry, my caddy, to, to clean for him. And Harry asked Blocky, he said, is your short game usually this good? And he goes, no, it's usually better. <laughs> That's, I was debating whether to ask you that. I was like, you wanted oh to my God. I, I was like, but I mean, I like, but it's great. Like how much, like how much confidence is that? He's like, no, it's probably, it's usually better. Yeah, but um, it's just—I mean, what a week for him! I mean, he and he certainly made the most of it after. But good for him, you know. He, you know, it's people are going to be excited to see him at Valhalla next year. And um, yeah, look, when you're when you're a club pro, and you know, you you know, I think as well, like there was a people really bought into that story, and it was really cool. And it it certainly added to it added to the PGA championship this year. It was a, it was a great story. It was, it was cool to be a part of that hole in one and, and everything that went on as well. So um, look, has, you know, has he made some statements afterwards that I probably disagree with? Absolutely. But again, whenever you're getting asked a million questions from a million different people, it's so hard to not say something that, you know, oh, geez, I've been, uh, you know, I've I've certainly regretted regretted things that I've said or or, or answers that I've given to questions, and I'm I'm sure you know Blocky's probably feeling the same way at some point. But um, I it still doesn't take anything away from um, like what a cool story in golf that that's been this year. Yeah, it was that scene up eighteen. I was with y'all's group was pretty ridiculous, and to get that ball yeah. up and down. 
unbelievable, especially with everything that was on Insane. the line. That was uh, to get back in, wasn't it? He needed yeah, that. Guy, After watching it, I was like, he, oh, he's going to go through all this, and he's not going to get this up and down, and he's not going to get in next year. And then he and did. He, got up. he did, yeah. Or wait, and wait. On, 17, on 17, he got it up and down from that cross bunker that was like 70 yards short of the green. Yeah. Yeah. He, he you and know, he hit it and everything. Yeah. Real, and yeah. It was just, it was, yeah. He didn't have a birdie that day, but he did have a home one. <laughs> no, it's normally better. <laughs> that's, that's yeah. He goes, yeah, it's usually better. Like, well, that's okay. so funny. That's so good. <laughs> yeah. All right. Really well, funny. let's, let's get into some fun stuff here. Let's get to the E9. Um, we asked this to everybody. And I don't think you're going to have an answer because you're Roy McIlroy, but you can trade lives with anyone for a day. Who would it be? Ooh. Um, I mean, you're <laughs> right now, uh, you're, it's Lionel pretty Messi. Good. Messi. Oh, yeah, that's a good answer. Absolutely yeah. messy. I mean, he is just, he's killing it. It's so I don't cool know. He didn't watch. score the other night. I think he's starting to, he's starting is he to lose it? Go a little bit. <laughs> is he losing it? Is he yeah, past his over. time? This is a sidebar question, though, Roy, because like Messi being down there in South Florida, that's got to be awesome for you. But and I know you're a big soccer guy. Do you have any American sports teams that you've like ha- have an allegiance to now, or that you follow or enjoy? You know, that you'll put on a jersey for or whatever. Um. So all of my in-laws uh, are from upstate New York, big Bills fans. Ooh, so yeah. that's sort of a that's the. I guess my my adopted NFL team. Do not point. jump through a table. I was about to say, dude. Was... Bills, Bills, Bills Mafia, baby. Yeah, do not jump through a table. I enjoy walking with you, and I don't want your career to end because of that. <laughs> no, my back's already as bad, as bad as it is. So, yeah, how are you feeling? By the way, last time we yeah, saw I'm, you, uh, I'm good. I'm good. good? I'm good. I'm, uh, I've had some good, yeah, good sessions. Good, good, some good rehab. Um, you know, exercises. I'm, I'm, I'm probably ninety five percent. Yeah, I'm I'm way better good. than I was at the Tour Championship, so yeah, all good. Beautiful, beautiful. Good to hear it. All right, I'm kind of, I'm very interested to hear this one from you because Colt and I will ask players, especially young players who are just getting on the tour, who's the one guy you watch like on the range that you're just like, oh my god, wow, when they get out there. And pretty much every single time, it's you. You're the answer, right? Like you make people doubt their, you know, being on the PJ Tour. They're like I can't do that. All right, now I'm going to ask you outside of Tiger. Give me one guy, it could be current or previous, whose game you look at and, and something just wows you like, oh my God, that's special. Um, Michael Block. And Block, you can say Blocky <laughs> short game if you want. Blocky around the, around the short game area. Uh, I would say... Uh, You can also say no one. No, it's not no one. There's there's a lot of guys that I. I Have you seen Colt hit hybrid? Colt hybrid's up there. Yeah, pretty good. Darts two oh five. Look at it. Blocky. Yeah. Foul. Um, Trying to. There's so many. I'm trying to think of like one that like has really stood out over the years that. Um. I would say so. I'd say the the one that really like took my breath away was I played, and this is this is going back, and maybe it's because of where I was in my career and sort of where he was in his. But I played the Dubai Desert Classic as an amateur in two thousand and six, and I hit balls beside Henrik Stenson, and he was hitting like eight irons, seven irons, whatever it was, and it's almost like I could feel the strike of his ball in my feet, like it was. It was diff- it was just different than I had I had ever felt before or seen before. Um, so that was that's one that sticks out of my mind. That's just like really really impressive. I think if we were to go to now and someone that like I would turn around to to watch on the range or or to see, it would probably probably Rambo. Like I just like how he compresses his irons and. And the speed that he can generate from such a short swing, you know, he's just, he's super impressive and, um, you know, just super like, like consistent. I don't really feel like he hits bad shots. You know, he just sort of, yeah, it's like shell and peas. It's, it's really impressive to watch. Yeah. Y'all don't hit many bad ones. There's no doubt about that. It's <laughs> funny. Uh, Will Wilcox, who used to play on the tour for a little bit, is caddying for Sung Jay now. And in Memphis, he walked over to me and goes, what the hell are you and I ever thinking we can compete with these guys? And I'm like, it's a great point. It's a very great point. And I have accepted it. And I'm very happy. I don't, with what I'm I don't know, Cole. I, it, you know, whenever we played against each other in the Walker Cup, it was, you were, 
Yeah. Things you change, Mox. Yeah. You were very Things are good. different now. <laughs> um, all right. You got your Grove 23 hat on right now where you practice down there yes. in South Florida. Got a lot go. of tour guys, Michael Jordan, a lot of other athletes. Who's the easiest money at Grove, Grove 23? I'm guessing um, it's not Michael. It's not Michael. He gets too many shots and the course is set up too well for him. Uh, it might be one of the, pro- it might be, uh, I play a lot of golf with Shane Lowry. He, uh, he just, he just joined there a few weeks ago. I, I'm going to say Shane. Yeah. Shane, Shane, Shane. Shane, Shane, Shane doesn't, Shane doesn't get me that much when we're, when we're at home. I like it. Friendly fire. Yeah. Friendly, Friendly fire. fire. Yeah, friendly fire. He can handle it. Beautiful. Just, uh, just get, just getting them motivated for the Ryder Cup. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Yes, I like that. Uh, all right. Next one for me. Do you think it would have been a good strategic move if Zach Johnson had shocked the world and selected Philip Francis as one of his captain's picks? Philip Francis, about my Philly? arch nemesis, my arch nemesis <laughs> in uh, in junior golf. I always finish second to Philip Francis. Um, I don't know. How, how's Phil's game right now? No clue. Uh, he's, he's he still play a whole lot. He made okay. a shit ton of Bitcoin. He's, he's uh, traveling the world. He's, like he's got things figured out, but I run into him on occasion. was texting with him yesterday. I was like, I'm going to throw you in here. Okay. See what Rory's um, react. Because he's, the, the, he's like, you've said, I think he's like the one guy that growing up kind of had you. Yeah. He was I a monster. Like 14-year-old Philip Francis. Um would have a chance on the U S Ryder Cup team. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Glad to know somebody has your number. Um, all right. Next one on a scale of one to 10, how bad is the winning Ryder Cup hangover? Um, it's probably a nine. Ooh. And I would say the only thing different is a losing Ryder Cup hangover. That's probably awesome. a 10. Mm. <laughs> either way we're going to be hung over either way there's there's going to be drinks consumed on sunday night absolutely yeah the champagne the champagne hangover oh. probably the, probably it, it the just, worst hangover like wedding stings the eyes i as as a precaution i don't want to tempt fate here but i did i did ask the european um like the the guys manage the team if we could get goggles this year if we do have to spray champagne because champagne in the eyes is Sucks. It is no fun. Sucks. It is no fun. Man, champagne's disgusting. I don't even like it. Pretty much every other sport does it. You're except just, hockey. Colt, you're just not you're just not cultured enough. You just haven't, you know, you just <laughs> need we, we need to your your palate isn't re- as refined as I like as tequila ours. and Coors Light. Coors Light I, in the eye. That. Doesn't even hurt at like all. My dad, you're like my dad. My dad loves Coors Light. Exactly. That's why we get along so well, among <laughs> many other reasons. He's a smart dude. Good taste. Good taste. Yeah. All right. You got to get a little creative with me here, Rory. Okay. But since you're going to Rome, got to ask a Rome themed question. Give me one professional golfer you would be most afraid to face in the Coliseum as a gladiator. Ooh. Um, that is a good one. One of the big boys, Tony Finau, maybe. Yeah, I had a couple. Tony um, would be a problem. Tone would be tone would be a problem. Um, long levers, I would say. Mm, I don't know. R- Rambo would be up there yeah. too. Rambo would be. Uh, yeah, he's just a big bit. He so he the big we boy. played. We we played. I remember we played a tour championship a couple of years ago, and for whatever reason, I just asked Rambo. I'm like. Or yeah, maybe ask me, he's like, what what do you weigh? And I think at the time I was like 165. And he just started laughing. I'm like, what what's he goes, I'm 90 pounds heavier than you. I'm like, <laughs> holy shit, no way. So um yeah, Rambo's a he's a he's a he's a big boy, big unit. And he's fiery. He could come out he's with fiery. that. He's fiery, he can mask. Yeah, he's got uh he's he's got a pretty excitable nervous system. He could he could get going very quick. All right, I'm yeah. gonna go to two matches. Dangerous. I'm gonna go to two matches throughout your career, and I want to know out of these two guys which one you wanted to punch in the face more. Okay, 2016 okay. singles match Patrick Reed, 2007 Walker Cup Billy Horschel. 
Billy Horschel. <laughs> I'm not saying something. <laughs> yeah. You hated <laughs> Billy Horschel something. back then. Oh, I absolutely despised him. And we've actually become really close since, which is, <laughs> which is great. But um, yeah, that Billy in that 07, I think as well, it was like he was, you know, we were all probably obnoxious at the time, but I think because I was at home as well and I, he was like, pretty rude to the crowd at times too and it was like they're my people it's like i'm you know i'm gonna beat his ass but um we actually have forged a really good friendship since and um billy billy's a good dude i like him a lot that's awesome uh, i figured that was gonna be yeah. the answer that'd be a good battle yeah that'd it would definitely be billy. battle billy was yeah billy's that's... geez billy's in billy's in good sh- billy's probably one of the like one of the golfers in, in best in their best shape like he is a he's he's a strong dude yeah, you guys are same weight class. So we could probably make that fight. Um, yeah, we're like welter welterweights, middleweights. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Could maybe catch weight if we need to. Um, <laughs> yeah. All right, my last one. This is actually a real question because I think you and we've asked this to other people before, but I think you may be the one dude possibly in golf that has the power to make this happen if you want. So, in your expert opinion, would you prefer it if the Ryder Cup changed the format to set the matchups each day to mirror what they do at the Presidents Cup? Yes, you put one out. We match it. We put one out. You match it. You get big dogs against big dogs. Yay or nay for Ryder Cup? Uh, God, you say yes, please. I'm, say yes. No, It'll, I'm going to say nay. I like the, the draw. I like the, I like the surprise. I think there's a little more. I think there's a little more strategy to it. I think there's a little more. Well, if they, you know, they might put those guys out, whatever, and you know. I, I just think there's a little more strategy to it. Oh, well, yeah, I, just, I just, I think, I think the, I think the president's cup can get, I think it can get a little contrived that way. Oh, well, it'll never happen now, Colt. Our dreams are crushed. I know. I, was, I thought we had a hey, chance. Again, I'm just, I'm just a player. I'm just a player. I did hear <laughs> yeah. that back in 2016, the you and Patrick Reed match was kind of set up a little bit. Confirm or deny. Uh, they look. They might have known where, when I was going out, but um, not not necessarily. I think at that point everyone knew I was going out one, so it was more just whoever was going to go out. You know, who was whoever wanted to play play me on that side. So I wouldn't say it was set up, but I think it's pretty. I don't think I've ever played outside of the top three in the order, so it's pretty. I tried to do it with Tiger in 2012. I told him. I said, "I'm going out three. I said, go out three. Like I, I wanted, I wanted Tiger. I'm like go out three, and uh, he they ended up hiding him at the at the back of the pack. He but um, I, I, yeah. Oh, I don't know. If he, I, uh, we I could have got that with the yeah, Presley's so. format. We could get that match. You know, I think it would be awesome. Yeah, it it, it uh, look from a from a purely like a product and entertainment standpoint. I get it. I understand. Um, but I just think in terms of sort of trying to figure out what they're going to do. And I don't know, like, I, I, I feel like I can sort of like, I like, so like Friday foursomes at the Ryder cup this year, I would say, I'm pretty sure Xander and Patrick are going to go off number one like that again, but that's, I'm sort of like trying to get into Zach's head and be like, okay, well, what's he going to do? And who's he going to play in the foursomes? Who's he going to play in the four balls? All that sort of stuff. So I, get the I think that's pretty thing. cool to yeah. try to figure out. Yeah. I don't know. I just feel like if there's any animosity, like it'd be fun to set that up because yeah, yeah. it makes builds more drama, like a prize fight. Yeah. I, yeah, I agree. I think there's going to be, I think there's enough on the line and there's enough, you know, yeah. Is it, you know, as, as you said, to get like four heavyweights, you know, battling each other is a, is, is pretty cool. But, um, I think the Ryder cup is, there's enough drama in it anyway, without having it to, you know, without having to try to set anything up. I think, I think there's enough going on. Yeah. I cannot wait for it to happen. All right. Last one. My, my opinion. After his performance at Justin Thomas's wedding, do you think Kevin Kisner will be a future contestant on dancing with the stars? Mm. <laughs> um, do you want to jump me to get Erica to come in here? Cause all he was trying to do was dance with Erica. All- her dad, like, yeah, his dance partner, Erica. <laughs> yeah. I think she's going to say no. <laughs> uh, she would probably say no. Um, Kiz, no, I, I think, um, well, I don't know. I mean, the way he's played this year, dancing might be the, might be the future. Beautiful. 
Love that. I don't. I don't know. If, I don't know if that was too close to the bone. Sorry, kids, but it was. It was low hanging fruit. No, uh, he, he owns it. He's fine with it. That's fantastic. He can handle it. Yeah. He's tough. All right, Rory. Well, as always, man, we appreciate you taking some time to join us. Um, I'll be. We'll be seeing Pleasure. you both over in Rome. Yes. Wow. See you over there. I'm. Uh, I'm so excited. It's going to be such a great week. Yeah. Here's to you. So hoping cool. y'all finish second. I, I I knew that was coming, but I appreciate Nothing it. Nothing personal, just business. Personal. No, just business. I got it. All right. Thank you, you so much, Rory. I appreciate you, man. Thank, Thank you, guys. you so much. Yeah, no, thanks for having me on. This was awesome. All right. That was Rory McIlroy joining us on Subpar, man. It's been a long time coming. So happy to sit down with him. And it just works out perfect. Two weeks away from the Ryder Cup over in Rome. You know, at the start of the year, these guys were massive underdogs. Now you look at the betting boards. Uh, you're looking anywhere from minus 110 to minus 115 USA being the favorite, but this is the leader of that team. Um, he's had some unbelievable battles. The battle in Paris with JT Hazeltine with Patrick Reed, which by the way, I love saying and one of the best matches in the history of Ryder cup, going back to the Walker cup though, who he wanted to punch more Billy horse or Patrick Reed. Sorry, Billy. He loves you now though. That's good news. Damn. Good on Patrick Reed though. I think mean, he gets asked that question. There's not many that go the other way. That's true. You know what I mean? It's, it's good PR. For P. Reed. Yep. Or should get a little fired up out there. And then the, uh, the Michael Co- Block comments yeah. to, to Harry on the 18th green mm. there, Sunday at the PGA. Uh, rather interesting, but it was a funny story. That was one. Listen, I love Michael Block. We've had him on the show here. You know, things have been great for him. He has caught a few. He's caught some strays. Here and there. He's caught some serious strays. And I debated because Rory told me that story about the short game and how he says it's usually better. He told me that story before. And I was like, mm, I don't know if I want to bring it up at all. And then the fact that he brought it up was just fantastic. Yeah, I do. Like, I feel like Block is misworded a few things, especially like the Rory driving guy. I think if you go back in time, like that came out the wrong way. He was also doing interviews for the first time in his life, one after the other. If you do six hours of interviews and don't say one stupid thing, then God bless you. But like he had the best week of his life. Everything was happening for him. He's been, a you know, a driving range pro type of guy giving lessons for his whole life. All of a sudden he has a spotlight on him. Like, yeah, soak it up, dude. Milk it for all it's worth. But he has caught a few strays but confident dude is your short game normally this good nah it's usually better normally better dude but man i <laughs> just ain't I, shit Roy mcroy is one of my favorites to walk with out there every week with cbs i mean the way he drives the ball just absurd he is going to be a force to be reckoned with over in rome um you got to think that next that fifth major title hadn't won since 2014 it's got to be coming soon he's been knocking on the door i think what i said seven of those last eight majors he's finished in the top eight Dude, he contends every single week, and that's why it's like if you don't close out the vast majority of them, you know, you're going to take some shit. And Roy's one of the few guys that's like every single week he tees it up. It's like he should win. There's not that many guys out there. But I think the best thing for him, man, like off the course is just kind of the – I guess it's like just in flux right now with the PJ Tour or the PIF. Like he's been, whether voluntarily, voluntarily or involuntarily, the guy up there front and center answering all the questions which ain't his job by the way and if he wants to take that role on awesome and he did it uh but he was doing it week after week the amount of just like extra energy that takes and then to also be like i gotta get ready for a golf tournament i think this stuff all kind of like come into a simmer right now um huge for rory mcelroy because that's just a huge shoulder to or a huge burden shoulder for for anybody yeah well it's going to be interesting to see what happens, but just love sitting down with Rory. Best of luck to him and Team Europe over at the Ryder Cup. Hope they finish second. Yeah, runner-up's not bad, dude. Trust me. All right, well, let's get to some gambling. Finally. All right, we got PGA Tours back, Fortnite Championship. We're going to do, as usual, a favorite and a dark horse. Um, this has been the Max Homa tournament the last couple of years. Back-to-back champ. He is your pretty big favorite. I believe big he's 7-1. to one. Almost two Next times. Next best, JT, JT at 12-1. to one. Um, I'm gonna go just a little farther down the board. I, I like this 18 to one. We've been saying it for a couple years now. This yeah, guy keeps saying it. Keep this saying guy's it. gonna win. There it's go. just a matter. Of, I mean, he's a California kid. I like it. Um, the golf course. I feel like it's one of those ones anyone can win on. Long, short, whatever, crooked. It it, it does help to hit it straight. Um, it, it is pretty narrow, but these guys love this place. I'm gonna go South the Gala 18 to one and picking up his first PGA Tour win. We just keep saying he's going to win soon. That way, when it happens, like, told you. Yeah. We're on the front end of that one. Three years late, but it's fine. Yeah. Obviously, called another one. Uh, I'm going a little further down the board here because I think this thing's wide open. Like you said, Max way out in front, and then it drops a lot. My favorite that I'm picking, 35 to 1. Okay. And it is none other than Bo Hostler, the Bo Show. Uh, I think the time's coming for Bo as well. He worked his way into contention 
a number of times last year. He's worked hard on that golf swing. And if you look at it from when he turned pro to where it is now, it's completely different. He's driving the ball way better, which was always his Achilles heel. Like he just couldn't drive it straight. He was one of the most crooked guys on the PJ tour. That's gotten a lot better. I just think the time is coming with this field. Why not bow? So give me the bow show. 35 to one. Best dress subpar guest of all time. Oh, God. All right. My dark horse. I played with him. This, just a few days ago out of Wisprock. Game looks nice as long as he doesn't change any freaking clubs before he gets there. Uh-huh. I loved everything he had in the bag. He's one of the straightest hitters out there, one of the best iron players on the on tour. I think this place sets up perfect for him, and I love 55-1. to 1. Give me Kenny, Chez, Reavy. It does set up perfect. Yeah, I mean, perfect it? golf course, Chez, Reavy. Did he miss a fairway? No. Not with the soft fairways. No. no chance. No chance. No chance. He I mean, never it was misses. a boring 68 from all the way back. Yeah. he's. It's just, there's nothing that can go wrong, really, with it. They just don't switch any gear. It's a problem. It's mm-hmm. got to get away from those manufacturers. All right. My dark horse. Not too far off from where I picked my favorite. Okay. I'm coming in at 55 to 1. Good golf course for this guy. My guy, Homeless Hubs. Okay. We love him here on the show. If he drives it straight this week, his putter is phenomenal. Maybe you break out a little stinky pinky there at the end on a victory celebration. But um, it's like I said with Boat, it's not the most stacked field these guys are going to see all year. I think you're going to see a bunch of guys up there at the top, maybe fighting for their first PGA Tour win. I think um, Hubs is very much a candidate for this. Went to school right down the road. San Jose State. Obviously comfortable up in NorCal. Give me homeless Hubs, 55 my, to 1. My only concern is he's a little sensitive i think mentally he's down a little bit because he's a broncos fan he is down and his twitter did not look good yesterday no and he's he's right to be down we've been waiting a long time to ride and we're still not riding all right and he likes to drink wine so take that for what it's worth that's true i was talking to joel damon i was like the other day he came by the house before we did a little Ryder cup celebration for max and i was like dude nap is perfect for you because yeah I tend to have a little too much fun, though, that week. I'm like, yeah, that's fair. You got to factor that in. There's some dudes up there like, bring the family, bring the wifeys, do all this stuff, and it's not quite the same vibe um, as maybe a typical week on the PGA Tour. But Hubs, he knows how, trust me, he can play in any any sort of condition. All right, I'm going to throw a football pick at you since I have gone 2-0 and to start the season here mm-hmm. on the show. I'm going to stick with college football. Stay on it. And this is a massive spread, but – this team's the best team in college football. The Georgia Bulldogs, they're 27 and a half point favorites over South Carolina. The Cox suck. So I think Georgia runs them out of the building. Give me the dogs. Even though I hated on them about their schedule, give me the dogs minus 27 and a half. Did you just did a little wordplay there? Did you even know you did that? I didn't. Was that totally accidental? <laughs> wow, it was crazy. All right, you're going just monster favorites. When you go to USC like minus 30. Something yeah, like that. And they've wasn't been that hitting. big a favorite. They've they been hitting. hitting. By, the, by the way, Gamecocks aren't that bad. Rattlers decent. They won some big games no, at the end suck. of last year. They were close against uh, Carolina, but um, also Georgia's Georgia. I yeah. will never doubt the University of Georgia in anything as far as um, I'm on this earth. Okay. All right. I'm going to get hot. I got a greasy push last week. Okay. This week, I actually feel really, really good about this one because I think this team is undervalued based on their week one performance. Give me the LSU Tigers. Minus single digits, 9.5 against Mississippi State. I know they laid an egg, especially in the second half against Florida State. In Starkville. I still think that they are a monster team. They're going to be a force to be reckoned with still in the SEC opening game. A lot of things can change in that time. Only single digits against Mississippi State. I know it's at Mississippi State, but, dude, Mississippi State just needed OT to beat Arizona, who ain't it. So, LSU, I mean, if they can't, I would be shocked if they don't win this by double digits, which is means they'll probably win in a squeaker because I am not warm right now. But we're just warming up. All right. We'll see what happens. Can't wait for some more football. By the way, the Cowboys won 40 to nothing over producer Mark's Giants. That's just right. Just y'all forgot. Sorry, Mike. Also, make sure you go pick you up some polo gear. Go to radgolf.com. Use that code subpar for 15% off your purchase site-wide. And also, golfpride.com. $10 off, 13 or more grips. Swing it like Rory McIlroy. Grip it like Rory McIlroy. Or wouldn't you? All right, that's going to do it for us. We'll talk to you on next week's Subpar.